Хората казват, че мечтите ни дават крила. В днешната история обаче ще ви покажем и мечти, и крила. Как се съчетават тези две неща в едно четричленно семейство, ще ни разкажат самите те в следващите минути. Не за изпускане! What is the first thing that you think um, are going to say to Mark when he lands? Why are you late? <laughs> should be here three hours ago. Three months ago. <laughs> three months ago. with your dad earlier today and he said that the first thing that he's gonna tell you is you're late what was the first thing that he told you um well we haven't really talked yet to so just sort of congratulations basically as soon as i've done i've only just landed um but so i'll talk to him later but yeah i haven't do you remember the first words of your sister or your father or your mother i think they were all just congratulations we haven't we really haven't had much time to speak yet so what's the feeling to have your kid back back. He, he goes to school next week, he's good. Ah, uh, my little brother's home again, oh gosh. <laughs> no, uh, it's uh, very happy obviously, uh, it's really nice. Happy to have the family back together. Yeah. What so was wait. the first thing that you said to him? I think I said, I said how was the flight? <laughs> um, and it was good, he said it was good. Did you t tell him that he, he's late? I didn't, <laughs> I told him well done. <laughs> I was talking a big game earlier. <laughs> How do you see the future of airplanes? Do you see them pilotless? Um, well, I think in the future that's definitely the way it's going to be. Uh, but in, in, in just general aviation, so for moving people, for moving stuff, uh, I believe that that's the way it's going to go because it's just simpler. Um, but I think there will always be just aviation for fun and that there will always be people who are trying to strive forwards in aviation and complete new records. How do you see your future in terms of aviation? Um, so I'm not entirely sure exactly what I want to do in aviation, just carry on forwards and carry on in small airplanes. What was your first motive to do the tour? Um, so when I got my license I was 15 and I wanted to do something special with that license. I, did, I didn't just want to sit on it. So I decided I but I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do but once my sister flew around the world to become the youngest woman to do so uh, I thought that's an amazing thing I'll try and do the same thing she said that if the sky is the limit she's looking above it and she's looking towards space are you looking at the same direction um, no so m my passion really is just just aviation um, I, I'm sure it would be lovely to go out in space um, but my my passion really is aviation what was the scariest moment during your tour? Uh, so there is, a, there is a scariest, but I think the, that one that really gets to there is the, my Pacific flight um, from Japan to the US, uh, flying over the North Pacific for 10 hours and then landing on a small uninhabited island uh, called Atu Island and just having to sort it out there. Did you have a, a rescue team on ground? Uh, no, so there was there was no one on Atu Island. It's uninhabited, um, and so I just had to stay on a small shed, um, had some Oreos and a protein bar for supper, and then woke up the next day and just had to carry on. How long did it took for the preparation be before you started the tour? Um, so uh, there was about six months of preparation, but I think it only really kicked in three months ago because. It's surprising the amount of preparation that has to be done quite near to the start. So, for example, visas, permits, things like that, they have to be done quite near to yeah. when you're actually going to go. You can't do them six months in advance. You have to do them quite close to when you're going. So there's a lot left unanswered when, even when you're already on the, on the road. What did you miss the most? Um, the, I missed the most just, just being able to sit down and do nothing, probably. Um, even though... It's amazing to go around and do stuff all the time and never be bored. There is a, a sometimes you just want to sit down and have do nothing for, for a while. Were you daydreaming? Um, 
I guess sometimes maybe over the Indian Ocean, the Indian Ocean was quite easy so it was less stressful because it's not a very cold ocean and the weather was very nice all the time so that was quite a bit of daydreaming then, I'd have to wake myself up and, and, and concentrate on the flying again. What are you dreaming for now? Um, so, well, the, my next thing is definitely going to go back to school and just just catch up as much as I can. Who took the first decision about flying? Who's the oldest pilot from the family? The oldest pilot. The oldest? The oldest. Oh, the oldest. <laughs> Come on. No. Well, technically, I'm not the oldest. oldest. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get divorced no. in about an hour. <laughs> I'm the oldest. I know a lawyer, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I'm the oldest. When and how did you decide that you want to fly? Uh, I don't know how, uh, but I took my first flying lesson when I was 13. So very young, and I've flown ever since. What about you girls? I learned to fly much later. I was 35. And uh, and it was a dream come true because I had been flying with my dad when he uh, when I was a, a little baby, and uh, and so it runs in the family. I think Zara and Mac are fourth and fifth generation pilots. You decided that you're gonna be flying at 35. Yes. Was that a hard decision? What were you doing before then? Um, it it just came because because of circumstances, and I mentioned it to my husband. And the Christmas present was flying lessons. <laughs> was there a backup plan for any of you if flying turned out not to be your profession? Well, so I'm actually going to university to start studying probably electrical or aeronautical engineering. Uh, so, so that's kind of what, where I want to go to. And then, and then, uh, and then at the same time, I want to keep flying. So, yeah. If we imagine that in probably near future planes would be pilotless. How do you see your role in flying? Uh, well, actually, I'm a big proponent of pilotless flying or big aircraft. I think it's a, probably a good thing and it's the future. Um, I just hope that they allow us to keep flying the little ones and then it's all okay. <laughs> <laughs> what about your plans for the future, if that's the case? Yeah, I like flying small planes, so that's okay. And then, yeah, for me, to university and then uh, keep flying. I think we're going to keep flying together if they still allow small planes and that we're still going to be uh, doing adventurous flying. Yes, if that's possible. And also, um, they're making a lot of progress in electrical aircraft. So with a bit of luck, in a few years they're there and then, um, and then they can be electrical flying. Did you have any worries about your kids? Is that what you wanted for your kids' future? Uh, that they fly? Um, not professionally. Uh, I'm very happy if they do or they don't. I know that Zara doesn't want to fly professionally and Mac at the, mom at the moment says he does. Um, but flying to have for fun and flying as a passion I think is, a, is, is great obviously. It's nice to have your kids um, uh, following and sharing your passions. Um, but there's no, there was no pressure. Um, it was up to them to choose. We just created the opportunity uh, and supported them in whatever they chose or wanted to do. How did you imagine your future when you were little? I think when I was very small I dreamt I wanted to work in the circus that was my big dream yeah um, but what happened with that dream yeah so it turns out I'm not very good at doing backflips so <laughs> instead uh, instead I said it's flying <laughs> um, and yeah so I just I mean I was just a kid so I, I've dreamt of flying I dreamt of flying around the world uh, I always dreamt of going on a big adventure does any of you remember your first plane like if, if it was a toy, a image, or an actual plane? No. No, I remember my first flying lesson, um, which was, I think I was ill. <laughs> but, um, but Was that because of the lesson or just in general? <laughs> no, the, the lesson, it's, um, it was a very hot sunny day and uh, we did some aerobatics. Um, and uh, yeah, I got really ill. <laughs> so, but it didn't put me off. But no, that's my first memory of anything sort of flying. Yeah, I think in the first few lessons as well, I felt a little bit seasick, but you get used to it very quickly and then it's okay. While you were just traveling around the world, did you have your um, on ground team? Uh, you had search and rescue team? I, you, sorry, oh, right. I did, so when I was flying around the world, I had people back home, so in Belgium and the UK, so my parents, and then Megan as well, who's here, so an amazing support team back in Europe who were tracking me live and making sure that everything 
uh, went smoothly in case uh, I were to go down. <laughs> Do you had any fears? I wasn't necessarily scared, sometimes I felt nervous, sometimes the weather wasn't as good as it was forecast, but for the most part I felt, I felt okay. <laughs> when you took the decision to go around the world, what was your biggest fear? What, what was the biggest insecurity? I think probably my biggest insecurity was precisely that, the insecurity of it. I wasn't too sure what to expect because at the end of the day, sometimes there are surprises in aviation and you just hope they're good surprises rather than bad ones. And so then, so yeah, that was the big thing was I wasn't too sure what I was, uh, what, that, what, what could happen. What were your biggest fears? Mm, that's a good question. My biggest fear was obviously that my children wouldn't come back. That, that was absolutely the biggest fear. Um, the second biggest? Uh, probably... Oh, probably that the stress was going to be too much on, on the family or any of us. Um, and that we were going to end up in a, in a lunatic's house or something. <laughs> it was a lot of stress. It was uh, it was uh, it was not an easy year, but we are incredibly proud of what they have achieved. We also knew that they they were very very competent pilots, and that um, they could definitely achieve it. But there are a lot of elements you can't control in these sort of adventurous um, endeavors. So yeah, if you don't control it, you don't know what's going to happen. So. Did you had any fears? Um, a little bit, perhaps not so much. I, I think uh, I was mainly worried about a, a, mecha a significant mechanical failure. Uh, I had faith in both of them uh, as sensible decision makers and as pilots and as aviators. Um, I knew we had a great support team. Um, so really the only thing that was uncertain and perhaps was open to or uncontrollable was if something went wrong with, with the engine or something else. Um, but again, we checked the aircraft very carefully all the time um, and nothing went wrong touch wood, with, with either aircraft significantly. So uh, no, there were a few moments of, mm, that's not ideal, but, uh, but nothing more serious than that. I, um, yeah, I had faith in them. How long was the preparation before you started your... For me, it was pretty short. I think it was three months of preparation. Three months, four months? Three months. Something like yes, that. Yes, that was a gift. Yeah. <laughs> so told, Thank you for that. I told my parents, <laughs> and then I was like, please, can you help me? <laughs> um, and then, yeah. And then three months, and then my brother, thankfully, after I went around, I think you kind of had a bit of a guideline for what to do for Max trip. And so, I mean, it wasn't easier, but it was um, more straightforward, I think, to get yeah. on with the work. Well, we were very lucky in that the, the entire team that helped us with Zara all turned around and said, yep, yeah, we'll do it again for Mac. So we had a pool of people who already understood what was involved, the, the difficult parts, uh, the complicated aspects. Uh, and so we could go straight into the new uh, endeavor with the same team who already had a vague idea of what was coming. How did Bulgaria came in the whole plan? So I was looking for sponsors to fund my journey and then Dimitar from ICD Soft called me up one day to tell me that he wanted to become the main sponsor and ICD Soft wanted to sponsor, which uh, was amazing. And so that's how, well, Dim ICD Soft is based in Sofia. And so then I decided to stop in Sofia and kind of, you know, say hello and, and go see ICD Soft and the people part of it and just be able to say thank you in person. And now, thankfully, they're sponsoring Rack as well. So Bulgaria has become a really big part of both of our trips, especially for Max since he's started and stopping here. Was there a conference, conference between your two kids when they were younger? Because they're trying to <laughs> overjump each other. Um, no, it might look this way for the outside world, but not really. Of course, they have a healthy little competition going on, like all siblings. But um, not really, because first of all, I think it was Zara who put the <laughs> idea into her brother. <laughs> she was also uh, part of the team supporting and helping Mac. But most of all, they weren't competing for the record. Um, Zara is the youngest woman uh, flying solo around the world and Mac is the youngest overall. So he's not taking her, her record, he's, he's taking it off of uh, Travis Ludlow. So, so no. So if people say the sky is the limit, what's your limit? Uh, I think for me it is the sky. Uh, but I think you have aspirations to go a little higher. I, my dream of mine is to go to space, well, to become an astronaut. So. 
we'll see. Mine, I think, is to, to adopt another child and do oh, another yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, I did say no to Mac at first. I did say I don't want you to do it. So um, it, it took a month to, to convince us, to, um, for us to allow him to go. If you had the opportunity to inspire other people to follow their dreams and reach the sky, what would you tell them? I think it's to stop telling yourself you can't do it because for a very long time I I thought I'm I dream of flying around the world but it's not possible for me because how do I start something like that and actually what was strange was that that was the biggest thing that limited me because once I decided to do it and once I decided I'm going to do this 100, I'm going to try my best 100% all the pieces of the puzzle started to fit. I got sponsorship, I found a route. Shark also, the aircraft manufacturer came on board to loan me an aircraft. And then suddenly my dream became a reality because just because I said, I'm doing this 100%. So I think that's the big thing to people is if you're dreaming of doing something, you have to do it, you have to get started. Was there any moment that you were fed up of being in the plane, being in the sky, just wanting to go back on ground? <laughs> Yes, sometimes. <laughs> I remember there was one flight, it was eight hours long over water. I think after 30 minutes, I, I was done. I was just thinking, <laughs> I want to be on the ground. I, wanna, I, I don't want to be flying over water right now. It's very boring over water. How did you, did you overcome that? I was listening to music and podcasts. And that's kind of all you can do for eight hours straight. Uh, Mac had a 10 hour long flight so over water so I couldn't that was that is a lot more boring than eight hours um, but yeah thank you so much guys what's your next goal sleep <laughs> sleep is a great goal yeah, we're really looking forward to uh, the next couple of days here in Bulgaria